Well, good morning. Um, this is the first uh, in something new that I'm giving a try while everybody's cooped up at home uh, and uh, has some time on their hands. Not everybody has time on their hands. Some of you are working at home. Some of you are working outside the home. I realize that, but even if you're working outside the house or, or working at, ho at home, uh, hopefully you're not interacting with a lot of people outside the home. Um, and so I decided this was maybe a good opportunity to provide some uh, some extra teaching content, some some things to uh, to think about from Scripture, uh, hopefully to encourage us and um, and inspire us and maybe challenge us uh, during this time. Hopefully it won't last too long. Hopefully the series won't be terribly long, but as long as we're cooped up uh, for as long as this whole um, state lockdown and, and, and quarantine thing goes on, I figured I'd try to regularly post some stuff. So this is yet one more weird thing that I'm trying, um, video uh, video teaching uh, here on my on my computer. Don't have any fancy video equipment, just recording this on my on my work computer. I'm here in my in my office at home and we're going to see how we do here. Uh, but I wanted to share some thoughts this morning uh, from Genesis chapter 28. Um, uh, Genesis chapter 28. And uh, what I want to do with this with this weekly series that, that we're starting right now is to is to kind of piggyback on or, or, or eavesdrop on some people's encounters with God. Uh, look at different characters in the Bible and see how they encounter God and, and see if we can enjoy their enjoyment of God. If we can watch them worshiping God and we worship God along with them. Um, so uh, we're going to try to do three things uh, with this message today and then with any other messages that we do in this series. First, we're going to study passages looking for that catalyst for worship. So I've chosen passages where individuals in the Bible have worshipful encounters with God. And what we want to do is to try to see God through their eyes and be awed by God in the same way that they are. Um, that worship and awe at the character of God as he reveals himself to these individuals uh, that we're going to look at one by one in the series will then lead, I hope, to the second and third thing that we want to do. So the first is, is simply worshiping God and having a catalyst for worship. But the second is to find comfort and joy to sustain us during this lockdown. Um, I mean, those things can feed each other, right? Um, you know, worship, awe of God leads to joy and peace and comfort in God. And joy and peace and comfort in God can then feed our worship. And so we want to see that happen. And then the third thing that I hope is going to happen in the series is that our awe at God will lead us to want to talk about God with others. Uh, to talk about God with one another, and then particularly to talk about God with unbelievers. You know, we talk in terms of evangelism uh, in, in churches, we talk about uh, how, you know, how do we help people become evangelistic? How do we help people get passionate about sharing the gospel? And churches will typically do a couple of different things. They'll do evangelism workshops where they try to train people in different methods of doing evangelism. And those can be valuable. I've, I've been through some of those myself and they can be useful. Um, and, and sometimes churches will, will do kind of guilt laden messages where they try to try to really make you feel bad for not sharing the gospel and try to get people to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus in that way. Uh, but I really believe that what we need more than that is to catalyze an evangelistic heart uh, through a refreshed wonder at who God is. I think that, more than anything else, is going to help us become people who are passionate about sharing the gospel. Uh, if we are passionate about God, if we are excited about God, if we are awed by who God is and what he has done for us through Jesus, then it's going to be natural to want to talk about that with other people. Uh, I realize our current situation poses some challenges, to that, to sharing the gospel, but I think it could also present some unprecedented opportunities. You know, you go out walking in your neighborhood right now, and you see more people outside taking walks than you did before. And, you know, you got to keep your distance, right? Keep six feet away or whatever. Uh, but what we found is that even with keeping distance, people are, are eager to stop and talk. They're eager to chat, even from a distance. And, and so I suspect that there are some really good gospel opportunities out there. Um, and they're looking, people are looking for reasons to hope, reasons not to be depressed. They're looking for sources of joy. 
Um, and we have that to offer them in Christ. So let's see if we can find that for ourselves um, in, in our story today. Uh, the individual that we're looking at, the encounter with God that we're looking at today is the encounter that Jacob has yeah, in Genesis chapter 28. So I'm going to read Genesis 28 verses 10 through 22, and then we'll spend some time talking about it this morning. All right? Genesis 28, 10 through 22. Here's what it says. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder, or some of your translations will say a, a stairway, set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And again, some of your translations may say the Lord stood uh, beside him or at his head. And he said to him, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place! There is This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. As we look at this passage, and and, and as, I, as I think about this passage, particularly in reference to you know, this current situation where we find ourselves, you know, um, trying to quarantine ourselves from uh, a virus that's out there in the world. Uh, what I see here is this reality that God often strips us of our strengths in order to teach us that he alone is worthy of our trust. God often strips us of our strength in order to teach us that he alone is worthy of our trust. And as I was thinking about it this morning, I was I was remembering that, that book by Sheldon Van Auken. Remember that one, A Severe Mercy? I think I've mentioned it probably before. Uh, it, it's a great book. If you haven't read A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Auken, I encourage you to get it and read it. But he tells the story in that book of, of his relationship with his wife. Uh, his name was, uh, was Sheldon. His wife's name was Davy. Uh, they had a great relationship. And, and in the book, he tells the story, that in fact, that their, their relationship with each other was so important to them uh, that, they, that they did everything they could to protect it. They were their own gods to each other. Uh, in, in essence, they, they made idols out of one another. They were the most important thing in each other's life. Um, and that worked for their relationship. Their marriage was strong. I mean, as you read the book, you, you kind of find yourself, at least I found myself uh, envious of the, the strong, romantic and emotional relationship that they had. But then uh, a couple of things happened and he tells the story. And this is going to be a spoiler for you, uh, although you probably find most of this information if you just read the back of the book, too. Uh, but uh, two things happen in the course of his relation of his story. Uh, first is that they both became believers in Jesus Christ. So Sheldon and his wife, his wife first, and then later he himself became Christians. And they realized that God required them to worship him not each other, that he wanted them to love him more than they loved each other, not because uh, he's a needy God, but because he's the only one who's worthy of the type of, of adoration that they were before then pouring upon each other. And so that's the first thing that happened to them. They became Christians uh, and they realized that. But then the second thing that happened is that uh, Sheldon realized that in order for God to teach him to love God more than he loved his wife, God was going to take away his wife. And as the story progresses, uh, Davy contracts cancer and, and dies. And, and so much of the book is Sheldon's 
um, learning to, to understand that, coming to an understanding of that and realizing that in fact, uh, that was a, a severe mercy of God to him, to help him understand that, that his wife was not strong enough uh, to be the object of his worship, that only God could be the object of his worship. Um, and, I, and I realize as I share that story, you know, that nobody should hear that as, as, as me saying, or as, as the author saying that that's always the case for anybody who, who loses a spouse or anything like that. But that's of course not the case uh, for everyone. That was the case for Sheldon Van Auken. Um, but the principle, the principle I think is what's helpful to us that sometimes God strips us of our strength in order to teach us that he alone is worthy of our trust. And so that's certainly what we see, I think, in the life of Jacob and in his encounter with God. And in fact, we're going to look not just at this encounter with God that we read here in Genesis 28, but we're going to see a second encounter that Jacob has with God later on in Genesis 32 as well. So, uh, so two encounters with God, and they're both going to teach us this general principle, that God will often strip us of our strengths in order to teach us that he alone is worthy of our trust. So what's going on here in Genesis 28? Uh, in the background leading up to this story, we remember uh, a little bit about Jacob, that Jacob was the son of Isaac. He was the grandson of Abraham. He was the heir of the blessings, uh, but he's also a hustler and a liar. Uh, his name, Jacob, refers to the fact that he is a, a heel grabber. He's given that name because when he and his twin brother Esau are born, he comes out, Jacob comes out holding on to Esau's heel. And, and the people who were there at the time thought that was you know, I thought that was amusing because it almost looked to them as though he were trying to keep his brother Esau uh, from being born first. Jacob wanted to be born first and he was trying to kind of hold him back, I think was the was the picture that was presented. And so he was named heel grabber, Jacob. Uh, even today, we have something similar in our language. We talk about pulling someone's leg uh, in, in a sense of fooling them or deceiving them. And later on, uh, that certainly became part of Jacob's character. He was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was a hustler. Most recently in Genesis, he has hustled his way out of, uh, he's hustled his way into rather his brother's blessing. We know that story. Um, actually, it was just not that long ago, Kareem Smith preached this message for us from Genesis 27 about how Jacob uh, deceived Isaac, his father, and deceived uh, Esau, his brother, uh, and got the blessing for himself. And as a result, now in Genesis 28, Jacob is on the run from Esau. Esau has vocally threatened to kill Jacob. He's, he's kind of been out in the, in the bars, as it were, saying how he's going to kill his brother. And so Jacob runs away. Uh, and as he runs away from home and he goes to, toward Haran, where his, his, his mother's family is, uh, that's when he has this experience that we just read in Genesis 28, 10 through 22. So notice this encounter that Jacob has. First of all, we see this amazing vision that he has. He, he, he's sleeping there and he sees this vision. He sees a ladder or uh, ladder, I think, is, is not really helpful. We're used to thinking of it as Jacob's ladder. We have that phrase now in our in our culture. Uh, but really, since he later calls this Bethel the house of God, he sees it as God's house. I think it's probably better to see this not as a ladder so much as a, as a staircase, a uh, staircase to heaven, right? Um, so it's a stair, a staircase that he sees, a set of stairs. And it's what it says, he says in verse 12 is um, that the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord, this translation says, was at the top of the staircase. And he says, I am the Lord. So in short, what he sees is an entrance to heaven through which God's servants are going back and forth, uh, accomplishing God's business. They're, they're going to and fro from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth, um, doing the business of the master of the house. Uh, but the important thing to note is that these are the, the, the members of the household. They're leaving their home in heaven. They're coming to earth, but they're also going back from earth, going back home to the house of God, to heaven. They're going up and down, right? They're ascending and descending. Um, and it's important to note that because when you think about what Jacob was experiencing, that would have been particularly poignant for him, wouldn't it? Um, Jacob was traveling away from home, going on his own business because of his own uh, deceitfulness. Uh, and he doesn't know when he's going to be able to go home again. He can't go home again, right? He doesn't know when he's going to be able to go home again. He knows that his brother wants to kill him. He knows that his dad's not too happy with him. Um, so he's not sure when he's going to be able to go home. 
but here he sees the members of God's household freely coming and going back and forth to their own home. Um, I think probably part of that imagery was meant to show Jacob that for the members of God's household, he makes it possible for them to come and go as he wills. And he makes that clear with what he says to Jacob. Look at what God says. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And then after identifying himself, he issues his promise. He gives Jacob a promise. And it's a promise that should be pretty familiar to us if we, if we know the story of Abraham uh, that came before Jacob. There are, there are four elements to this promise. First of all, he says, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. So he promises to give him the land, right? Second element of the promise, he promises to multiply his descendants gratefully. Verse 14, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And then the third element of the promise is that God's going to bless the world through Jacob's family. In you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Starting to sound familiar? I mean, this, this sounds a lot like the Abrahamic covenant, right? This is God's promise to Abraham. And then again in verse 15, we see the fourth element of the promise, uh, that he's going to stay with Jacob and protect him and bring him home. Verse 15, behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. And then he adds, he adds again at the end of verse 15, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised for you. This is the Abrahamic covenant. And it shouldn't surprise us that this is now repeated to Jacob, because that's what God said was going to happen, right? Nor should we think that Jacob receives this promise for himself because he has uh, connived his way into it. And, you know, he has wedged his way into it by deceiving his father. And now he's got the blessing. Now he's got the, the promise of God, like this is his doing. No, God said he was going to bless Jacob. Back before Jacob and Esau were born, God said, the older will serve the younger. God announced his intention ahead of time of having the, the covenant with Abraham to be, uh, to be forwarded through Jacob rather than Esau. Uh, so, so this was what God said was going to happen, and this is what's happening. God is giving the promise that had been made to Abraham. He's now giving it to Jacob, and, and it's through Jacob that the promise is going to be fulfilled. Uh, God says to him, I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised for you. And he says, wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. Again, I think those words must have been very comforting to Jacob at this moment. He doesn't know when he's going to be able to come back. In fact, it's going to be... 20 plus years, right, before he returns home. But God says, I'll bring you home. You see, we may not know when our trials will end, but God does. God promises to be with us in the midst of them. We don't know when life is going to get back to normal after this, this quarantine, this lockdown, coronavirus. We don't know when things are going to get back to normal, but God knows. And whether we're in quarantine or not, wherever we go, whatever we're experiencing, God promises to us, like he promises to Jacob, I'll be with you. He's going to be with us too. He's going to be with us. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. So this is God's promise to Jacob. And then in the verses that follow, we see Jacob's response to God's promise. And frankly, there's some good and some bad in Jacob's response to God's promise. In verse 16, it says, Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. So his initial response is to fear God, uh, fear God for his holiness, to fear God for his power. Uh, he, 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 he enters into some worship here, doesn't he? How awesome is this? He offers a sacrifice to the Lord as an act of worship. Early in the morning, verse 18, he takes a stone and he sets it up and he, he makes an offering. He pours oil out on top of it. This is an act of worship. So, so these are some of the good responses that Jacob has. He, he, he has this awe of God. He, he, he sees something wonderful, powerful about God and he worships. That's what I want us to do too. I want us to encounter God in this way that we worship him. Uh, so he fears him, he sacrifices for him, he makes a vow to God, he's going to serve the Lord with a kind of a cautious trusting in God's promise. You know, if God will be with me, etc., then the Lord shall be my God. Uh, so these are some of the good responses that Jacob has to his encounter with God. 
but but there's also some bad in here too and it's his cautious uh trusting in god's promise that is the first thing that we see that, that's not really great he doesn't fully trust the lord as abraham had done uh, in verse 20 it says if god will be with me and will keep me in this way that i will go and if he'll give me bread to eat and clothing to wear and if i come again to my father's house in peace then then the lord shall be my god so there's kind of an if then thing he's not really trusting that god's going to do what he says he says you know if god keeps up his side of the deal then i'll keep up my side too which i think you'll agree isn't really full trust so that's the first thing the second is that uh, he, he lapses into kind of a really it's a paganistic understanding of god's dwelling place right he says in verse 22 this stone which i have set up for a pillar this is the stone that he had poured the oil on right this stone which i set up for a pillar shall be god's house which is odd right i mean he's seen this vision of heaven uh, a staircase leading up to heaven angels going up and down god's at the top i mean the, the, the picture is that you know there, there's a stairway to the sky to the heavens right and yet, even after this great vision, this grand vision of God in the heavens, Jacob is going to reduce all that. He's going to boil that down, shrink it down to say, this stone is going to be the house of God. It's really kind of a, uh, a paganistic way of thinking about it. So, so even here, and, and we're going to see some similar things later on in Jacob's life. But, um, but you know, this is how he responds. God... Uh, God is going to use him regardless. That's encouraging to me that, that even when our responses aren't 100%, you know, they're not picture perfect, not line item correct. God is still going to use us because it's about him keeping his promises, not about us being worthy of his promises. And that's what Jacob needs to learn. That's what we each need to learn. God often strips us of our strengths to teach us that he is the only one worthy of our trust. That's Jacob's first encounter with God. And Jacob's second encounter with God that helps illustrate the same point comes uh, just a little bit later. Uh, it comes in chapter 32, uh, which we're going to get to. But before we get there, we have to see what happens in between chapters 28 and 32. Um, and what we see is that Jacob's walk with God after this point is marked by a greater trust in himself than it is in his trust in God. For example... Although God had promised to multiply his descendants, uh, Jacob clings to control of his family through multiple marriages. And so as you skim through Genesis 29 uh, and 30, what you see are the marriages that Jacob has to Leah and Rachel and uh, their maidservants. You know, so he ends up with four wives and multiple children. So even though God is the one who said, I will multiply your descendants, rather than simply trusting God, um, Jacob multiplies wives to himself so that he can multiply children. And, you know, someone might say to that, well, hold on, Andrew. I, I mean, you know, he was tricked into the two marriages by Laban, his father-in-law. He was only going to marry Rachel. And then the, the, the concubines uh, who came later, they, were, they weren't his deal. They were his wives' manipulations and things. So it's not really Jacob's fault. Can you really lay that at Jacob's feet? But my response would be, you know, this is the ancient Near East. You know, we can't read that story in 29 and 30 with Jacob and his wives and children and think that Jacob couldn't have said no to any of this at any time. He absolutely could have stopped that and said, no, I'm only going to have one wife. I'm going to trust God to do what God's going to do. But Jacob, although he is seen as passive in this, just like he was seen as passive when his mother came and, and got him to help deceive Isaac, still, we understand that he's passively consenting right he's clinging to control of his family through these multiple marriages and we see that although god had promised to bless and increase him um, he clings to control of his prosperity through uh through a suspicious breeding program in fact i want you to look at this look at the end of of chapter 30 uh chapter 30 genesis 30 uh, verses 37 through through the end of the chapter there this is where you know jacob is is keeping his father-in-law laban's flocks and herds and and his father-in-law is paying him with lambs and kids that are born to the flock and 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 they make these deals where at, at one point laban says you know all of the speckled sheep uh, speckled lambs and and, and kids they're going to be your wages all right 
and, and, and Laban's cheating him at various different times. But, but Jacob, again, rather than trusting God's promise to be with him and care for him and protect him, Jacob figures out a way to take control of his own prosperity. And that's what he's doing here. End of Genesis chapter 30, verse 37. It says, Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees, and he peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. And he set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, in the watering places, where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks. And so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the flock in the flock of Laban. And he put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. And whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock so that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. And so the feebler would become Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys. I used to read that and be very confused about what was going on. And then, and then I spent nearly a decade ministering in the rural South. And this, what I'm about to describe to you is not particular to the rural South. It's, it's actually universal. And by universal, I mean all over, all, all cultures do this type of thing. But this is where I first experienced it. And in, in the South, um, they, they had this custom of eating black eyed peas, and collard greens on New Year's Eve or on New Year's Day. And the idea behind that was because the black eyed peas, when, when you cook them, have kind of a silvery tint to them. And the collard greens, of course, are, are green. And you're eating silver and green, and that would somehow ensure for yourself prosperity in the form of silver coinage and, and cash money coming into you. So by eating uh, black eyed peas and, and collard greens on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, you're ensuring that the, the next year you'd have lots of money coming into the household. Now, I don't think that anybody who I actually heard that from in the time that I was there actually believed that, but that was the tradition, that was the custom. And you know that traditions and customs start somewhere. There was a time when people believed that that type of thing would work. That, that's what's called uh, sympathetic magic. By doing something, you're influencing the larger course of events in, in a similar way. You could see examples of this all through world cultures and, and all through time periods. And that's exactly what Jacob is doing here. He thinks that by putting specked and speckled and, and striped things in front of the animals as they're breeding, that the, the lambs and the kids that they produce will then be speckled and spotted, right? But from a scientific standpoint, we understand that's absurd, right? That's not how that works. It doesn't matter what the what the ewes see when they're breeding. That's not going to affect, uh, you know, the, the lambs that they that they conceive in their wombs. And yet, that's what Jacob's doing. He's trying to take control. That's the point. He's trying to take control himself of his situation. He's not willing to trust God's promise. He wants to be in control. And we still see the gracious hand of God prospering him. God's going to prosper him, even though he's doing this kind of absurd magical thing. Although God had promised to care for him and bring him back home again, he still clings to control of his safety. Uh, by the time we get to chapter 31, when it's time for him to go home, he's going to leave um, under cover of night. He's going to lie to his father-in-law and try to escape because he's afraid of what's going to happen. Why? Because he needs to be in control. He's not going to trust God's promise, God's word to protect him. He's going to take control. Jacob's walk with God is marked in general by a greater trust in himself than in God. Nor should we be surprised at any of this. He learned this way of taking control of his own destiny from his mother, right? Back in chapter 27, as we heard from Kareem a few weeks ago. Uh, it wasn't enough that God had said, I will make the older serve the younger. Rebecca and Jacob have to take control of the situation by deceiving Isaac into giving them the blessing. And this trend continues right up until he gets back to the promised land. So let's get to chapter 32 now. In Genesis chapter 32, the first two verses, it says this. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. Does it sound familiar? It's like what happened at Bethel, right? This is God's house. Here he says, this is God's camp. And so he named the name of that place Mahanaim. 
which is a Hebrew word that means uh, two camps. You probably have a footnote in your Bible to that effect. Here's what I think is going on here. Although God had promised to bring him home, just like he brought the members of his own household home, the angels, which he saw back in chapter 28, going up and down the staircase to heaven, and just like he sees the angels here, when he again encounters God's house, as pictured here with the angels and the members of God's household, he still clings to control of his own life. He still clings to control of his own destiny by insisting on seeing this as a parallel camp rather than just God's camp alone. Do you understand? He calls it two camps. This would be like, this would be like if I came to your house with my family, you know, coronavirus aside, you know, I came to your house with my family and you said, you know what, Andrew, you guys can stay here for as long as you need. Uh, mi casa e su casa, you know, you know, you can stay here as long as you want. And I said, you're right. Su casa e mi casa. I'm not sure if the Spanish grammar there is correct, but, you know, if, if I said, yes, this is my house too. This is great that this can this house can belong to both of us. You would kind of be puzzled by that, right? You, you, you kind of go, well, no, I mean, this is still my house. I'm just generously letting you stay here. Right? It would be wrong of me to say, yes, this house belongs to both of us. But that's what Jacob's doing here. This is God's camp. I'm going to call it two camps. The two camps that he's referring to are his camp and God's camp. God's camping here, but I'm also camping here. This is God's house, but it's also my house. You see, he's insisting on holding on to authority over himself rather than relinquishing authority uh, by coming home to God. Jacob is not fully trusting in God for all of his promises. I wonder if we ever act like Jacob. You know, God has promised to care for us. He's promised never to leave us until he has done what he intends to do in us, which is for our good. But we're often unwilling to trust him. We're often unwilling to trust him. Well, we see that God disciplines Jacob in the rest of this chapter by forcing him to learn to trust him. Upon his return in fulfillment of God's promise, he fears Esau's vengeance. Look at what happens. Verse 3 of chapter 32. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent you to tell my lord, in order that I may find favor in your sight. Verse 6. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and there are four hundred men with him. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Jacob uh, is afraid of Esau. He's afraid of Esau's vengeance, and he struggles to fully trust God. He clings to control of his safety by dividing his family. That's what he does in verses 7 and 8. He's, he's going to divide his family into two camps, diversify his assets, so to speak, not all have all of his eggs in one basket. And so he's, he's, he's taking precautions in that way. Um, he, and, and he's not trusting that God will do what he said he would do. And yet, even Jacob, even at this juncture, Jacob realizes that there's something that he's missing. And so he casts himself on God's mercy. Look at verses nine through 12. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me and the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he casts himself on God's mercy. He does. But even still, he, he's struggling. He's of two minds. Just like the rest of us, much of the time. Right? He knows he needs to trust 
but he can't quite trust. He's like the man in the Gospels whom Jesus rebukes for not believing and then who, who turns and says to Jesus, oh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I think that's Jacob here. And that's a good prayer for all of us, actually. I believe, I, I trust, Lord, help me, help my lack of trust. God is going to teach Jacob to trust. He's going to teach Jacob that Jacob's own strength is not enough for his needs. And here's how he does it. I'm going to skip ahead uh, down to verse 24. Look at verse 24. This is, this is the substance of Jacob's second encounter with God. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go. That is, the man said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. God comes to Jacob in human form. This is God here, right? We're, we're clear on that. This, that, this is God in human form, who comes to Jacob and he wrestles with him. In essence, I think God is, is, is confronting Jacob with Jacob's own great strength. It's as though God is saying, yes, Jacob, you are strong. And he highlights that there later on. Uh, you have striven with God and men and have overcome. And God condescends to wrestle with Jacob in the first place. And then he condescends to let Jacob win, right? Jacob is winning at one point in this. Uh, God, in human form, asks to be let go, and Jacob will let him go, right? Jacob's winning, if we could put it that way. You know, I, I've heard this compared to, uh, you know, fathers wrestling with their sons, you know, and letting the, the son win a little bit. And, and, and certainly it's something like that. Certainly God could have won. God didn't need to wrestle at all, right? But understand, this isn't just a lighthearted thing. This isn't, isn't a father and son playing and having a good time. This is life or death urgent here. And Jacob is winning. God shows Jacob his own great strength. But then look at what happens. Although Jacob is winning, it is clear by the end who is actually stronger. Right? What happens in the end is that God touches Jacob in such a way that Jacob is deeply injured. Right? Jacob might have been winning, but at the end of it, there's only one of them who's walking away with a limp. And it's not God, it's Jacob, right? Jacob is shown his own great strength, but then it's as though God says, yes, your strength is great, but your strength is not great enough to do for you what I have promised to do. For that, you have to have someone else's strength. Your strength will not do. Your strength is, is broken. And it's so broken that the only way that I can show you that it's broken is to physically break it. And so he injures Jacob. Jacob walks with a limp after this. And we see that God is the one who's stronger as well, because after all, it's God who blesses Jacob. It's always the stronger, the greater, who blesses the weaker, the lesser. Jacob's strength is not strong enough to fulfill God's promises. God's strength alone will do what he promises. Jacob is awed and injured and blessed. God will often strip us of our strengths in order to teach us that he alone is worthy of our trust. God is a God who keeps his promises. He will bring us home again, just like he brought Jacob home again. We too may come home limping, but it will have been worth it in the end. That's our confidence, because God keeps his promises. The same promises he made to Jacob, uh, he makes to us. Or a better way to say it would be uh, that God, through Jesus, includes us in the promises that he makes to Jacob. He promised to Jacob, if you remember, to give him the land. And Paul says in Romans that this wasn't just a promise of the land of Palestine, but it was a promise of the entire world. And what does Jesus say? Who, who will inherit the world? Who will inherit the earth? The meek. That is to say, those 
who follow Jesus. They will inherit the world. God promised Jacob to multiply his descendants. Jesus will later say to his followers, there's no one who has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. To Jacob, God promises to make him a blessing to the world. We're given the world blessing message of the gospel. To Jacob, God promises to never leave him. And to us, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. In that first encounter with God, as Jacob saw the angels of God ascending and descending on the stairs to heaven, he heard God promise to bring him safely home. And ultimately, he does that for Jacob and for us through Jesus Christ. This is why much later in, in John's gospel, if you remember that obscure, uh, that obscure conversation between Jesus and Nathanael at the end of the first chapter of John, Jesus says to Nathanael, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Not on just a ladder or a staircase, but on himself. Jesus is the house of God. Jesus is the gateway to heaven. Jesus is our way home to God. Jesus is the one who makes all of God's promises yes and amen for us, as Paul says in First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians. But he only does this for those who know that their own strength is not enough. He will have us rely on him, even, even if he has to make us limp to do it. This is God's severe mercy. God will often strip us of our strengths to teach us that he alone is worthy of our trust. Maybe this... Uh, you know, this strange time that we're living in right now can be a time for all of us uh, to reach the end of our own strength and power and to learn a greater trust in the Lord. Well, that's Jacob's encounter with God. Uh, I don't know how many of these will do. I have several other individuals encountering God that I want to look at uh, and inspire our own trust. If, it's a, if this whole lockdown thing is short-lived, then it'll be a short little mini-series. Until then, I encourage you to learn to trust God, lean on him, and rest in him.